Hey guys, welcome to the History of FMW, episode 16. This is going to cover the second half of 1996. As always, I'm joined by Bahu, F M Bahu FMW. You can find him online at fmwwrestling.us or bahufmw.com. And um, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, now, last episode, uh, there was a lot of dealings going on between Tenryu and the War Company and Mr. Pogo. Um, and... Uh, Brett, you had figured out a couple things about that deal, so if you want to go ahead and you want to tell us, go ahead. Yeah, um, last episode I was kind of going over the whole Tenru Pogo I issue where Pogo ended up walking out and they offered him money. So I got exact clarity um, exactly what happened. So originally they scheduled um, Tenru versus Mr. Pogo in Sapporo, and it was going to be a no contest. Well, they... Uh, at the last moment decided no you're gonna walk out and that's what ended up happening pogo decided he couldn't you know change things around the day of when they sprung on him that you're gonna walk out of the match after tenru you know attacks you and make it look like it's a real like really you're just walking out well pogo didn't really like that he felt like it made him look like a chicken um but also during that match after Pogo leaves, his uh, protege or assistant, Toru, who um, would be better known now today as Magnitude Kishiwata uh, from Dragon Gate, he was still in the ring when, with Tenru after Pogo left, and Tenru legitimately beat the crap out of him and broke his eardrum uh, during the match. And then um, they wanted Pogo to, they wanted that match to set up. Um, a Yokohama match between Tenru and Pogo, and that's when Ten War offered Pogo $10,000 to do the job, but Pogo did not take the offer, so he never got the $10,000, like I made mention last episode, because he refused used to do any type of job outside FMW because he promised uh, Rai uh, working out working in outside companies that he would not do a job outside of FMW. So he never ended up making the money. But he also, and one of the reasons that he pulled away from war and ended up just signing with FMW was because he didn't really feel that was a professional thing that Tenru legitimately beat the crap out of his uh, protege. All right. Um I always love the way that the Japanese do these kinds of deals. It's always very interesting. Um, now, uh, before we get started, there's a lot of stuff going on from a storyline point of view. Uh, if you could bring us up to speed on the current angles of FMW going into July, um, featuring, you know, Mr. Pogo, Terry Funk, and Victor Canones. Yes, yeah, so I may mention last episode where it was uh, Mr. Pogo turned face after he lost to Masato Tanaka, uh, and Victor Canones got upset at him and shoved Mr. Pogo, and then the headhunters attacked him, and Mr. Pogo would end up t turning face, and so this was to set up Mr. Pogo versus Ter Mr. Pogo as a face against Terry Funk at Shia Dome in August. That was going to be their next big show, and it was going to be uh, a double hell exploding barbed wire death match. All right, and um, and one last note from the previous one. Uh, Matsunaga he announced that he was going to be leaving FMW in June. Um, where was he going to wind up going? He ended up going to Big Japan. Um, I may mention last episode there was the pay cut issue, and he just kind of wanted to be a bigger star, and even though it was a small promotion, and he wanted to do the death matches, and he wasn't really, really getting that opportunity in FMW to do the type of death matches. Uh, that he that he had in wing and he also wasn't really getting to be a star like he was in wing uh while in fnw speaking of that um his first uh match in big japan was on july 19th and it was uh the famous circus net uh match where they had a scaffold across the ring and um uh you had uh, a barbed wire net crisscrossing the ropes it was uh matunaga and great kojika against Nakamaki and I I I Yamakawa. Um, this was the first of a string of of what kind of became Big Japan's calling card for this time period, where they had kind of freak matches, um, and we'll go over a few of them maybe. Um, but w w whose idea was it to have like you know they had like the dry ice casket match, the piranha death match, the exploding balloon thumbtack death match? Like who was the guy coming up with all of these crazy ideas? It was a combo of Great Kojima. 
Jika, who was the owner at the time of Big Japan, as well as Eiji, uh, Eiji Tosaka, who was the booker and referee. Um, he's the president today of Big Japan. So it was kind of the combo of them working together and kind of coming up with ideas. Um, we're not going to talk about them too much, but I am curious. Do you have any favorites of these kind of kind of freak matches? Well, as far as this time period, my uh, the circus with Matsunaga and all that, um, the circus definite match is my favorite when it comes to this. But uh, a year earlier is actually my favorite one, uh, where they where Kendo Nakasaki is doing a training with all the young boys, in Yamakawa, and he ends up just going insane and just beating the crap out of them in around the town and all these people that were watching like this, thinking that they were just going to watch this just expedition of just match. Uh, Nagasaki's just beating the crap all over town, going into stores and using objects, beating all his students. He just goes crazy and just leaves a big, big mess all over the neighborhood. Yeah, I I actually watched that a couple of months ago, and they're going into shops and destroying food stands. And I always wonder who pays for that, but um, uh, it was a it's a different time period. And when most people know of the death matches from this era, everyone has kind of seen a few of these you know, insane stipulation matches. You know, they had alligator matches where Matsunaga wrestles an alligator and all kinds of goofy crap. So uh, going on to FMW news, um, FMW, they ran Kurokin Hall on July 21st. The main event was uh, Kentaro, Can- Kentaro Kanemura versus Super Leather, um, and uh, it drew a sellout. Um, now, last episode, we talked about how they were doing more of the death matches. Onita came back. Or, well, Onita was coming back for appearances. Um, is there any feeling that FMW is having a resurgence after the second half of 1995? Yeah, no, they've been doing it. Uh, they've been doing well since the beginning of the year, pretty much. Uh, there was there was comfort and FMW never made a lot of money or this FMW never really made a lot of money, but this, at this time period, they're making a profit. They're doing well. Everything's, you know, everyone's getting paid the amount of money that they want. Everyone's happy. This this is, um, the, the highlight pretty much of, of the, the new FMW as far as the time period and how much money they're bringing in and stuff like this. So, uh, yeah, they're definitely Corrigan hall shows are bringing them money. They're doing well with the Sapporo shows, uh, house shows never really made them that much money. And they, it was a, kind of always a loss. Uh, but as far as the entire six years of the new FMW, this is the best t- t- as far as they're, they're drawing. Uh, what is the current shape of Hayabusa, and what are the plans for him for him going forward short term? So he's still gonna be the he's still the top guy and everything, but he's still recovering from these injuries. And I made mention last episode where he was told by a doctor, "You're gonna need to take a year off." Well, he couldn't miss May fifth, so he had to um, you know work the Kawasaki match and everything. And but he. After about this is about now seven months, a little less than seven months, he's decided I'm coming back full time. I gotta, you know, I'm the ace. I need to reclaim my spot um, and show why I'm the ace. And so they he comes back early and, and like I made mention last episode, they did an angle where he had left for a couple months and he had um, kind of disappeared and he just showed up backstage watching one of the. Koji Nakagawa saw him from the ring and ran in attacking him because he had they had kind of portrayed like Hayabusa had left FMW when they needed him. So this was to set up the uh, uh, Hayabusa Nakagawa match uh, for Shio Dome uh, on August first. Speaking of which, uh, we're going to go over that uh, kind of match by by match. Um, uh, the main event of the August first Shio Dome show was a kind of famous Terry Funk Pogo explosion match, but we're gonna go uh, we're gonna go it bit by bit. Um, what was Hayabusa's comeback like? So his match against Koji Nakagawa, um, he he gets chipped pretty well in this match. Uh, the crowd is chanting Hayabusa, especially afterwards. But the match itself is horrible. It's one of the worst Hayabusa matches. Is he's still not fully recovered. Um, Koji Nakagawa is not that great of a wrestler. He's okay, but it just fell apart. And it was they booked it for a 20-minute match, and it just didn't go well. They never really clicked. They didn't click very well in that match. So it was a disappointing match. But um, I mean, if you watch the match afterwards, you see Hayabusa just kind of collapse, uh, and while walking back 
to the back and everyone's just screaming Hayabusa, Hayabusa. And it's actually a cool scene uh, watching it. But as far as the match quality, it's one of the worst Hayabusa matches. Um, also on the show, uh, Kanemura defeated Masato Tanaka to win the uh, the FNW Independent title. Um, what kind of effort is there being made to build up the new stars? Yeah, they're they're pushing Tanaka uh, and Kanemura. Uh, both of them are kind of brought in as kind of Tanaka is kind of the number two face, and Kanemura right there along with him. Um, I- Arai really, really liked both of these guys, and Goito, the booker, really made sure to push these two guys, always keep them strong. And, you know, Masato Tanaka had a lot of talent, and, and you know, everyone saw that in ECW and stuff, that he was a great worker. And FNW picked up on it right away, because usually they don't push someone like they pushed Tanaka after just th- less than three years, three years of a career. But they gave him the number two spot pretty much right away, um, just behind Hayabusa. So they were making sure to push um, keep them strong for the upper mid card matches. In uh, the main event, uh, Terry Funk defeated. I'm using quote fingers, Mister Pogo. In uh, it's on. It's a double hell exploding match. So two sides of the ring don't have ropes. Um, and then they have these uh, barbed wire nets with the bombs in them. Um, now during the match, Pogo is severely injured. Um, if you could just kind of go over the match for us. Yeah, it, it only goes a couple minutes until Mr. Pogo falls into the uh, exploding barbed wire that's on the outside of the ring. And um, when he fell, part of the barbed wire kind of just jip, like chipped the bottom of his chin and kind of pulled his neck up and uh, broke his broke a vertebrae in his neck. And Terry Funk doesn't know this, so he stalled. When Mr. Pogo is not getting up, he's just laying there in barbed wire wire glass all this stuff and terry funk doesn't know what to do so he just starts stop- he you know doesn't know he has to do something so he ends up blowing fire on mr pogo not knowing what happened so mr pogo's laying there in barbed wire after just breaking his uh, uh, vertebrae in his neck and now he's getting uh fire uh, blown at him so and they end up getting word that mr pogo wasn't going to be able to make be able to get up so they call the match right uh, it only went a couple minutes and there's an ambulance and they have to stretch her off mr pogo uh and i mean mr pogo was never i mean especially the fnw version of mr pogo was never a great high flyer or anything like this but this limited mr pogo even more for the rest of his career all right, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about Mr. Pogo's injury a lot more going forward, uh, but this leads to uh, FMW. They ran Tokyo on August 23rd. Uh, the main event was a no-rope barbed wire match between uh, the Wing Army, Kanemura, Hito, and Hosaka against uh, Masato Tanaka, Kuroda, and Nanjo Hayato. Nanjo. I've never honestly heard paid attention to this guy, so I'm sorry about that. Um, what happened during this match? Yeah, so this was a uh, a really... It was at Corrigan Hall, and this match... this Like I said, this is kind of the, the highlight of FMW, this time period and everything, as far as they're making money... Uh, this this type of FMW, the new FMW. So they're you know they're making money at this point, and also the crowds are are insane as far as just how loud they're getting and everything. And this is one of the matches that I think about uh, when I think about the new FMW and stuff, just how over the crowd was, was as far as just the screaming and everything. And in this match, uh, Nanjo, who we haven't really talked about too much, he'd been he's been with FMW the last couple of years. Um, he came in from the PWC, the Pro Wrestling Crusaders promotion back in like 94 or so. And he's just been an opening card guy. Well, this match, he's kind of a star in this match. He's doing a Sasuke special over the no rope barb or over the barbed wire. He's doing a moonsault over the la- on off a ladder he's kind of doing all the hayabusa moves and everything um in this barbed wire match and just the crowd's going crazy they're chanting for him but nanjo's thing is he was just too small and even in this match he takes the loss and i mean they don't really follow up very much with him after this even but this match uh the crowd is going crazy and th- like i said this is just kind of like this is fmw the no rope barbed wire the this is kind of the it's it's different than the Onita type of matches. This is more athletic, more moves, more um, just a different style than what the FMW 
with Onita had been. And personally, I just I love these kind of matches, especially with how much the crowd was just so energetic and how loud they would get. Yeah, I agree. Like I said, when I was doing tape trading, you know, after Onita, this is um, this is the era that I really loved. You know, the six man, the barbed wires, all of the young talent. I loved it. Um, also on this tour, we start seeing a character called the uh, the Black Hayabusa. Uh, who was this? That was Jose Estrada. Uh, he was best known for being in the Los Bariquas in WWF, but he had came in through Puerto Rico with Victor Canones, and they came up with Hayabusa, you know, just being kind of a, a Mexican gimmick and everything. Um, they just kind of the natural thing was to have an evil Hayabusa. So they came up with this gimmick, but it didn't really take off too well, but it lasted for about a year or so. Um, and actually it started with Hayabusa and Black Hayabusa teaming up but after one match black hayabusa t- turned on him and then proceeded to join the puerto rican army um and mi- and then he would end up eventually becoming the crypt keeper later on in fmw okay all right cool and um so okay going into september on september 1st uh i just loved reading these little tidbits um samurai tv debuted um now just to give a background samurai t- uh, uh tv anyone who was a tape trader and even now you know people know it but back in the day when i would get my my tapes uh, uh it would uh you know most shows would start with this samurai tv fighting tv and you would get little bits and pieces online that there is this uh satellite only wrestling channel and as a kid it sounded so mysterious and so amazing um if you want to talk really quickly about that well yeah so this is really important um because we've talked about how fmw the beginning years onita they didn't have tv but now they and you know they ended up getting with gaura um pretty much the only station that was willing to show fmw or michinoku pro or stuff like this well now with samurai tv starting fmw now has tv big japan now has tv battle arts all these different independent promotions get can now be watched by fans now it wasn't you know this is the first year of a cable network so it's not like it was overwhelming success right away but this was a way to get these smaller promotions outlets so people can watch their shows a two-hour show once a month or twice a a month or so so it was very important to for the independent scene that there was television because otherwise it was just commercial tapes and it's hard sometimes to get a following through just commercial tapes because you got to spend a hundred dollars to get a vhs tape back then and everything so this is a way of getting you know a wrestling fans gonna oh i want to watch you know big japan well let me check check what else is on you know what other wrestling shows are on this network and you could possibly get more fans based off this yeah and um um i don't know for anyone who wants to know it, it, there are many ways to watch it nowadays there are a couple services that you can buy if you want to watch it now but the one thing that um i started watching it a couple of years ago and you realize there's only about 10 new shows per month and then the rest of it is just kind of reruns but it's still such a great service and um, it's actually not that popular, though. Uh, supposedly, it fluctuates between ten and twenty thousand buyers a month. So it's not super popular, but still a great resource for wrestling uh, in the country. Um, so going back to FMW on set on set on September first, uh, they returned to Nagoya, and uh, the main event was a six-man exploding match, uh, kind of similar, you know, Tanaka, Kuroda, and Nakagawa against Hito, Hosaka, and Kanemura. Uh, what role did Hayabusa play in this match? Well, uh, first off, I wanted to kind of talk about the match itself and everything. And this is, again, one of the more popular matches because of just how brutal it is and everything. And in this this match in particular, you have Koji Nakagawa. He um, ends up getting thrown into the exploding barbed wire, and then he gets he takes the enziguri kick just seconds later and falls into the exploding barbed wire uh, outside the ring. So he takes two exploding barbed wire bumps in just a couple seconds between each other. Just devastating, awesome show. Uh, just looks awesome. But then you also have Kanemura, who ends up getting burnt really bad taking an explosion near his ear and he ends up had taking he ends up missing the whole month as a result of this match and um i want and also so uh because he was ended up missing the whole month shoshi arai ended up giving him a ten thousand dollar bonus for this match 
which actually upset Hideki Osaka, who was also in the match. Going, he was like, "Wait, why does Kanemura get a ten thousand bonus, ten thousand dollar bonus for this match when I was in the match also and I didn't get any bonus?" So it act- and they were friends, so this actually kind of created some conflict between the two guys. Um, but as far as Hayabusa, Hayabusa is watching this match from a, a from um, from outside, like he's just sta- he's sitting there, standing there, right uh, by ringside, watching the match and everything. And then afterwards, um, Basada Tanaka calls. Calls Hayabusa to the ring, and pretty much everything gets made. They they make up essentially. Hayabusa is accepted back into FMW and everything because of that whole he disappeared, and so Hayabusa and Tanaka hug and and all is well. And so Hayabusa is now accepted by the FMW team after this match. Okay. Um. Now I I did have one question I wanted to ask. Did Onita give these kind of bonuses when people would get uh hurt? I had never heard of that. Um, I mean, it might have, but it was. I never. I never read a story or anything like that happening. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about that because it's very nice of him to do that. That's all. Um, so on September 11th, uh, FMW they promoted another wing uh, name show. Uh, what were the highlights of of this show? So this was pretty much the show I was talking about last episode with Hayabusa versus Hido, where Hido is the beloved f- fan favorite in this match, and everyone's booing Hayabusa, which is probably the first time that Hayabusa was getting booed in Japan. And so Hido ends up uh, pulling Hayabusa's mask off during this match. Uh, he takes a barbed wire bat and starts carving up Hayabusa, and so Hayabusa's bleeding all over his face is just covered in blood, and then kind of uh, Hayabusa kind of snaps during this match, and you don't see Hayabusa. Hayabusa really like this, um, you know, you'd never seen him like this. He ends up embracing the heel, uh, pretty much embracing being a heel for this match and just goes crazy and just starts biting Hito's head and making him, cutting his forehead open and using the barbed wire bat and kind of embracing the booze and everything. And uh, Dark Side Hayabusa hadn't showed up, but this was kind of the beginning of the Dark Side Hayabusa aspect um, where he's just he's just a different character, pretty much just a total heel, and uh, by just how much he's destroying Hito and ends up just uh, putting Hito away, and the fans are just booing Hayabusa so much because this was that loyal Wing fan a- audience that had came you know from a couple years earlier that came in. Um, and we've kind of covered this a few times, but uh, the uh, Mickey Ibaragi he never got any money from these shows, right? No, he just would. Uh, um, he never got any money from these shows. But like I said uh, a couple episodes ago, he had threatened to sue FMW based off them just using the wing name. But then nothing ended up ever happening. He was it was just idle threats. Okay. Um, so uh, going forward on September fifteenth, FMW they uh, they ran a, a large show in Sai Sai Saitama. Um, if you want to go over, what are the big uh, the storylines of the show? Uh, well, you know, the lethal weapon ended up kind of breaking apart during this match uh, or during the show. Uh, the gladiator, Ricky Fuji ends up losing and the gladiator and horse boulder end up just turning on Ricky Fuji. Uh, so they end up breaking up lethal weapon, which had been kind of the number one heel group uh, since the beginning of the new FMW back in May 95. So le- this pretty much is the end of lethal weapon weapon and it's actually kind of sad because after ricky Fuji gets turned on they show him uh crying backstage just blubbering just so upset over getting turned on by the gladiator and horace boulder and then in the main event um they have hayabusa or the fmw team against the puerto rican team and uh it's a uh yin on a pole match and it's for two hundred thousand dollars now keep in mind FMW, they had had a $250,000 match for Kawasaki that FMW lost, that Port- the Puerto Rican team, Terry Funk and Mr. Pogo, had won for Victor Quinones. But this, so this was kind of FMW's chance of getting the money back. So they ended up, Hayabusa ends up climbing the pole and retrieving the money. So it was kind of a callback to the Kawasaki match for, so that FMW had won back most of the money that they lost uh, four months earlier. Um, so this led to se- September 20th, where Hayabusa wrestled Oya for a chance at Kanemura's independent title. Um, Oya won the match, um, and after the match, Jinsei Shinzaki uh, uh, appeared. Um, if you can go over, what did he do on the show? 
So he just, uh, after the match, so Oyo defeats Hayabusa, which they had a rivalry going back to a year earlier. And so after Hayabusa loses, he's upset and everything, uh, punching himself for the for just losing to Oya because he always felt like he was a better he was better than Oya. So then Jinzei Shinsaki comes uh, comes out. Uh, he has his hair all all grown out and everything. He had worked. He um you know the year prior he had worked in WWF and his contract had ended he worked one new japan show uh at the tokyo dome against great muda back in april 96 and he hadn't wrestled any in between this so he t- taken about five months off or so and let, like i said had his hair grown out and he comes to the ring and all he does is just, just pray to hayabusa just uh, and just walks away well that ends up that's all it was to set up a match between hayabusa and jinzei shinzaki uh for the michinoku sumo hall show in october um, I have a, a few questions about this. Uh, first, where was Shin, Shinzaki wrestling at this time? Yeah, like I said, he had, he hadn't been wrestling at all. He had taken, um, five months off. Like he came back, uh, right after leaving WWF and started work uh, and worked at that, uh, Tokyo Dome show for New Japan against Great Muda where he lost. And, but he was Hakushi in that match, I believe. Leave. And then that was kind of the death of the Hakushi gimmick, which Michinoku would play up a year later. Um, but so this was kind of the return of Jinsei Shinzaki for the first time in several years to Japan. Like I said, he hadn't really been working in um, – he hadn't been working five months, so he'd been taking the time off and everything. Um, so this was kind of his reappearance to Michin- or to to um, uh, Japanese wrestling. He ended up showing back up at Michinoku Pro the next day. And then he started working for Michinoku Pro uh, that in September '96. All right, and um, uh, so to uh, to do the the match, like, did Michinoku Pro did they request Hayabusa or did FM or did FMW offer him? Like, how did the deal come about? It was yeah, it was just a talent talent exchange. It was Hayabusa is going to work uh, your sumo hall show, and we'll get great Sasuke for our uh, Komasawa show in December. So it's just a talent exchange. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I know that people hate the Hakushi gimmick where he's got the tattoos, but the first time I ever saw him was at the ECW Heat Wave show, and I thought it, it looked really cool when I was 12. So <laughs> what do I know? Um, so uh, going on, uh, on September 24th, uh, they ran a show at Kirk and Hall, and um, in the main event in a tag match, um it you know it was a bit a uh, very big angle. Uh, Terry Funk and Gladiator they defeated Hayabusa and Masato Tanaka and after the the match the Victor Kanonis group they destroyed Hi- Hayabusa. Mike Awesome gives him the big power bomb and they lay on American flag on him and this leads to uh, them calling out Onita. Um, it, did I miss anything in the angle there? Well, this is where they officially become the funk masters of wrestling. They, um, like I may mention a couple days earlier, the Lethal Weapon group had ended when they uh, Gladiator turned on Ricky Fuji. So this was just kind of set up, yeah, the brand new heel group. They had been just the Puerto Rican army, so it's kind of like the combo, the Lethal Weapon and the Puerto Rican group had kind of combined together to become the top number one heel group. Um, so yeah, so Funk says that the, that his FMW, the Funk Masters of, of wrestling is going to be the real FMW. Um, you know, what does he mean by that and what, and how do the fans take it? He, he means it by like Hayabusa and Tanaka. Those are just Onita's boys and Onita doesn't have a heart. He has the heart of a chicken as Funk would say. So his, his boys, Hayabusa and Tanaka, they're going to have the heart of a chicken. Also, they're not going to have the real fighting spirit that his, that his group of FMW guys have the headhunter, uh, Mike Awesome, Super Leather. They're the real FMW. They have a real, they have the real heart. Because they're from America, they're from Puerto Rico. They're, you know, so they have the real fighting spirit. So they're the really, they're the real FMW. Whereas the Hayabusa and the Tanakas, they can't compete because they're Onita's and Onita's boys. And um, you know, if Onita can't proper, you know, Onita's not the pro, you know, he can't properly teach them when Onita doesn't have the proper heart to teach them. Now, uh, like I said during the promo, Terry Funk he calls out On- Onita. Um, is this a planned call out? Like, uh, uh, basically, to make a bigger, you know, you know, a bigger question, 
What is Onita's relationship with FMW at the, at this time and with Terry Funk calling him out? Are there planned matches or are they trying to egg Onita on? Like, what is the deal behind this? Um, you know, Mr. Pogo, a couple episodes ago, he had made call out to Onita. He wanted another match with Onita because everyone kind of knew Onita was going to come back eventually. They just didn't know when. Now, Onita himself didn't know when he was coming back. So when Mr. Pogo was calling it out, it obviously at the moment didn't happen because by the, you know, plans changed and everything. So around the fall of 96, pretty much Onita now knows he's coming back. I think in, over the summer he had kind of kind of decided he was going to come back, but it wasn't really well, you know, he hadn't really let anyone know. Well, by this point, it's kind of now, all right, Onita's coming back, but it's not official or anything like that. But I think everyone kind of has an idea, okay, Onita's coming back, and it's probably pretty soon. And so Funk is calling him out because he, want, he wants to have a match with Onita. It's going to make him money. Now, um, with Onita coming back and, you know, Terry Funk being a bigger part of the company, um, is there more of a concerted effort to bring in, you know, to bring the death, the, the, uh, the death matches back and reestablish F, you know, FMW as, you know, we do the death matches? Well, it's just kind of a political move because you have Kanemura who likes the death matches and he's close with Goito at this time, who's the booker. And so... And that was kind of Goito's role as the booker, where it's like he has all these different ears, uh, he has all these different people talking in his ear, going, "Hey, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way." So you have Kanemura going, "Let's have the barbed wire matches. That fits me better. That gives me, you know, I have my style is more highlighted when we have these matches." Whereas you have a Hayabusa or you know Hayabusa side going, you know, let's no, this the original plan was to have straight matches and everything like that to showcase his style and Hayabusa is working for the office also at this point so you know obviously he's going to have a say in, in everything that you know he's helping booking and, and whatnot so he's going to have a big say in the movement so it's just kind of these po political fights and you know I've made mention Hayabusa and Kanemura never really got along uh, in FMW and it you know I mean I'm going to guess one of the reasons is because just these kind of political fights of just kind of struggling to where the company needs to go. And so, like I said, Kanemura and, you know, it wants to have these barbed wire matches with Tanaka and everything. And you, um, you got, you know, Hibusa side wanting to have the high flying straight style, strong style matches. Did the, uh, did Hayabusa have any, um, like, did he have a feeling that, you know, he, when they would book the, these, uh, matches, would he have any feeling of like, you know, like he didn't really want to do them, but he would do them for the company's sake or did he not really mind it? Yeah, no, he, he would do them, but he didn't do very many barbed wire matches. I, he only did three barbed wire matches, uh, ever. And, he he would do them, especially for the big shows and stuff. Um, but it was, it was always kind of kept limited and everything for his type of matches. He would do street fights. That's no big deal and whatnot. But, you know, it doesn't really sh show. He didn't feel like showcased his ability. You know, he was a good wrestler. And to have these kind of street fights, they weren't really showcasing his ability, um, you know, as much as he felt that they, that they should. Yeah, when you're taking the, you know, when you're – Taking down the ropes, there's not much that that he can do. Um, yeah, so and also, I mean, those, yeah, those three barbed wire matches I may mention. I mean, every time he got, mul you know, scarred up really bad in every single time. Just you know, all his scars that he has are pretty much from three matches of barbed wire matches. Yeah. Um, so after the show, um, they do. Uh, uh, Megumi Kudo uh, comes out and she announces that. She's going to be retiring on the May 5th show in 1997. So they're already building, you know, the big show a year prior. Um, why was she retiring? She had turned 27, and she and Combat Toyota had come in through the All Japan Women's Dojo where you retire at 27. Um, you know, you, you give your body that, and that style, and that's just how they were taught. You're just going to give your body out and just destroy your body for 10 years. And to be able to live a normal life, you retire at 27 so you can, you know, move on and be healthy because if you just keep going, your body's going to get destroyed, especially the style that they want worked so she just was under that mindset and just decided it was time to start a new life after after wrestling um i have one question about that now um as 
some people may may not not know Kudo is married to uh, uh, um, Hito. Were they dating at this time? Did that factor into it at all? Um, they were probably dating around this time, but it was completely private and everything. I actually asked Hayabusa one time, I go, did you guys know that, um, that they were, that they were together? And he goes, and he goes, yeah, but I didn't care. So, you know, so they knew, but I know when I talked to Ricky Fuji, he didn't know. So it was just kind of one of those, some people know, some people don't. But as far as this time period, I don't think it was known right because this is still another six months or so before she retired. I think it wasn't really well known until the very end, but I don't know exactly when it was found out. But like I said, some people, Hayabusa knew, some people knew, but some people didn't. Yeah, I was just curious if, you know, if she's thinking, hey, it's time to get a real life, we're going, you know, I've got a heavy thing going. I thought maybe yeah. that might might kind of uh, well. She got married it. about it, it's well. She got married a year later, so it was it's still or about fifteen months later. She got she got married, so it wasn't like she retired and then two months later she got she got married. So she was just I think it was kind of now I can let everyone know I am dating Hito kind of thing. Okay, um, yeah, that was always a big thing on the the boards of like this ugly scarred weirdo is dating this beautiful woman, <laughs> you know. But anyway. Um, because it wasn't, you know, it was. It, sorry, it wasn't a. It was a rule that they, uh, the men and the women weren't allowed to date. And so, I mean, Hito probably would have gotten big time trouble if it had came out and been public knowledge, or that he was dating Kudo because it was a strict rule at the time. Mm. All right. Um. And also, um. How is Mister Pogo doing at this time? So he's still. I mean, he's recovering. He's able to come back in November. So, I mean, it was a three month injury. And like I said, he was very limited the rest of his career, but I mean, the fact that he could work matches three months later, it wasn't like he was paralyzed or anything like that, but it was, just, you know, I mean, he broke a vertebrae. He was broke a part of his neck. So it was still a severe injury, but due to, you know, Mr. Pogo already being kind of limited and not like he was doing four fifties or anything like that. He was able to come back after three months, but um, he was still in pretty bad shape at this point. So um, on October 3rd, uh, it was announced that uh, that IWA's upcoming tour would be its final tour, and they would be closing the, the doors. As with all of the companies, they do come come back. Um, we haven't talked about it much since the, uh, the Kawasaki Dream, uh, King of the Deathmatches show. Um, how did IWA fall, fall apart so fast when they, you know, Dave wrote a whole little article about how they had one of the, you know one of the biggest shows of the year. They drew twenty six thousand some odd people, and here they are a couple months later, basically bankrupt. Uh, what happened? You know, how did it, it fall apart so quickly? Like yeah, so I mean, it's pretty much just um, the balloon popped, the bubble burst, and I mean, it happened with Wing, where Wing had was it was a successful company, and it was the end thing, and then you know a year takes a year later. And it's no longer the end thing, and they're losing money, and wrestlers are defecting, and that's exactly what happened with IWA Japan, where it was the end thing for a little while. It had Cactus Jack, they had Terry Funk, and then, um, you know, they weren't able to. I mean, in the wrestling business is hard, and to be able to run a successful promotion, and after paying, you know, big names like that, and you know, you have an unsuccessful tour, or you don't make that much money off a of Corrigan Hall show, and you're not able to pay the same, and then you have to make some cuts and and everything, and then it just okay. Now you're not now you don't have Terry Funk or Cactus Jack on the show. Now you have you know Tarzan Goto is the main guy, and oh, he's not drawn like you know the previous you know the previous guys and stuff like that you know so it's just it's like i said it's just a very difficult thing to just keep a successful promotion um especially back then and um you know especially when the the bubble burst and just the popular the new thing is no longer the new thing uh what does this mean for uh, uh goto and ganosuke so they end up uh, um ended up and uh, just so uh, at, around this time period uh, several promotions are kind of closing down um the tokyo uh, pro promotion is closing down uh the K koto fuyuki's group and everything they had been working um you know freelance and so there there was a sponsor um that uh, that was going to start up a, a new promotion called fff and so they had gotten Goto, Ganosuke to agree. It was going to be Fuyuki's group. It was going to be 
guys and everything like that. And um, they booked a Corrigan Hall show, and the sponsor ended up pulling out right before the show. And um, they they had already booked Corrigan Hall, so what they did was they canceled the show itself. Um, and but they actually let the fans that bought the tickets they could still go to Corrigan Hall, and you know the wrestlers were still there selling merchandise and everything in front of, uh, you know, when you go into Corrigan Hall and stuff. Uh, so, but as far as the ring and everything, there was no ring and they just never had a show. And so FFF is a promotion that literally closed before it ever started. And, um, that was pretty much, uh, it, uh as far as the Goto group, um, you know, and we'll get into it next episode. Donisuke, uh, he, I want to get. I, I just want to go back home. I'm just so he ended up wanting to go back to FMW. Uh, Goto would end up getting a deal with uh, Big Japan after the FFF group would fall apart, which which, which would change FMW, uh, the history of FMW, because if FFF had taken off, Kodo Fuyuki was a part of that group, and as a result, the Fuyuki group ends up finding its home in FMW as well. So close to dodging that bullet. Um, okay. <laughs> On October 10th, um, Hayabusa wrestled the, uh, the Mishinoku Pro Sumo Hall show. He lost to Jinsei Shinzaki. Um, is Hayabusa perceived any differently on these outside side shows? And, um, how does he feel about doing those shows? He got a good ovation for the show. Um, I mean, it's nothing, I mean, he's not the home hometown guy this was uh his first time in Minshinoku pro so it wasn't like he got this big giant ovation or anything like that it's especially you know going up against shinzaki who was uh the home to- the uh, the home promotion guy but so he got a pretty good o- uh, ovation and Hayabusa was always over with the different with the crowds and everything um as far as doing the other shows he didn't mind i mean he always was looking for more work i mean it's an extra payday on top of your you know the salary it's kind of like getting an extra gig um other you know than what you're making Making your base salary, you're gonna make more money out doing. So he didn't mind working other promotions and and everything like that. Um, as um, next year when he ends up working for All Japan more, his wife actually has a big time issue with how how um, how often he's gone. But as far as he goes, he's fine with working as much as possible. Um, now, sometime during October, uh, Victor Canonas gets in a a, a a real fight with. Fumi Saito. Uh, who is Saito? Why did they get into a fight, and what was the fallout? Uh, Fumi Saito is a, a work used to work for the uh, Pro Wrestling Weekly magazine. He had a column every week in every up uh, on every issue, and um, he actually was really uh, was good friends with Hayabusa and helped tr- um, Hayabusa a lot after Hayabusa's accident. And per- they were real good, close personal friends. Um, but as far as the uh, what happened was I believe Saito wrote something negative to, about Quinones in the magazine, and Quinones got word of it and had issue and uh, kind of sucker punched Saito. I actually reached out to Fumi. I used to talk to him a lot about ten years ago or so, but I reached out to him about this, but I didn't get a response. So if I end up getting a response as far as the exact details, um, I'll let you know. But uh, as far as what I know, I just believe Quinones had issues with what he said and and sucker punched him as a result. Yeah, that that sounds like one of the issues that they don't want to really publicize. So I'd be amazed if he if people want to speak candidly about it. Um, so on October twenty eighth, uh, FMW they ran Tokyo. Kanemura defeated Oya in a match for the independent title, and afterwards, uh, uh, the Gladiator who holds the brass knuckles title, uh, he cha- he challenges Kanemura to unite the uh, titles. We talked about it last episode, how the title was brought about just because they kind of had another title laying around. Um, I don't know. What are the politics of just saying, hey, screw the, screw this title that we've only had for a few months? Um, like, what is the process behind that? Well, they had put the money down for it and everything, so it was theirs, so you might as well use it. And But, yeah, it didn't really help with having two champions. Um, so they just decided to kind of merge the titles together, and, you know, All Japan had the Triple Crown at this time, so it kind of added the prestige to have double titles titles to have two different to have one champion with two, two titles kind of like how it was kind of cool to have the you know, the all japan guy have three title belts so this was kind of fnw's counter of well our top guy has you know two t- title belts also on the show mr pogo announces that he's going to be retiring on december 11th 
Um, now, backstage, there's an altercation with Onita. Um, I'll let you kind of tell the story, but what happens be, uh, between the uh, the two of them? Yeah, so around this time period is when Onita has officially announced that he is coming back to, uh, in November 1996. He announced, he told Arai, I'm coming back, I'm going to wrestle. And Arai's like, no, you can't. We, you know, we just promoted you for a year to a retirement tour. You can't just come back, right? You know, in a year and a half, you can't just come back right away. And then he goes, "Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, I'm going to." to um, have a match with Mr. Pogo. I'm going to, we're going to team. He, so Anita came up with the idea. So he, he's going to go, Mr. Pogo is going to announce he's going to retire and he wants Onita to team up with him in his retirement match. Well, Mr. Pogo didn't really want to retire. So Arai goes, wait, Mr. Pogo doesn't want to retire. So how are you, how's this going to work? And Onita goes, oh no, it's no big deal. He can just come back after six months. Like we're just, you know, we'll just, he could just retire, you know, retire for six months and then he'll come back. It's no big deal. But at this time period, so it, Onita wants to kind of have this special feel of I'm coming back and it's Mr. Pogo's retirement. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to guess also it, it, you know, Mr. Pogo's retirement added to the fact that like, Ooh, what if this show doesn't sell out? My comeback doesn't sell out, you know, just kind of, Mr. Pogo retiring kind of was guaranteed the show is going to sell out and be a successful profit show. Well, so Mr. Pogo, so it's brought up to Mr. Pogo, you're going to retire. And like I said, Mr. Pogo doesn't want to retire. So what they end up having to do is come up with a plan and what it, they have to pay Mr. Pogo six months salary straight up. Here you go. And he just gets to sit at home for six months. And as a result, he has to leave FMW. And so this, this is kind of the beginning of Onita just deciding, ah, this is what's going to happen and Arai allowing it, but kind of getting annoyed by it. But again, Arai's in charge. Charge, but just kind of letting Onita take charge and make the make the decisions and everything like that. So this was something that just kind of was the beginning of this Onita freight train of just upsetting and pissing off everybody uh, by just, hey, I make the rules. I started FMW, even though it's not even my company anymore. I'm still making the rules. And Arai let him. <laughs> but so – in theory, uh, uh, the F uh, the FMW office they could have said, "Hey, Onita, we aren't going to do that." But then Onita would just go somewhere else and give his name value to some other company, right? Yeah, but also you got to remember, you know, this Arai was brought in because of Onita. Arai would not be here with. That would not be Rai wouldn't be running FMW if it wasn't for Onita giving him that job. So Rai always felt indebted to Onita for hiring him in the first place when he was just some you know no twenty something year old kid looking for a job. And so Rai always felt indebted to um, you know listening and just always giving in to Onita. And Rai at the end would say he that was a mistake, but at the time period, yeah, he wanted um, you know he always wanted to do well with Onita. He always wanted to get along with Onita. One of the pieces of feedback I, I get a lot for this show is um, you know a lot of people they uh, they really like the show. They want to tell us it's fun, but one but one piece of feedback I get a lot is people realizing they say I never knew that Onita was such a dick. There's no other way to put it. You know he was such a bossy guy, and this is a great example of that. Um, so yeah, and it's get it's 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 going to get worse too as we, as we get along to where uh, I mean ultimately he ends up having to leave FMW and we'll get into that later on but yeah no it's him just I mean he has an ego and I like Onita I I you know I respect him but I know what it, I know kind of what to deal with with Onita and that was a lot of politics and a lot of ego and I mean he's a star he makes he made thousands and you know or millions of dollars through wrestling and you know he has a right to that ego but again it's kind of like the Hulk Hogan thing of hey he has that right to have that ego but it's still really annoying and he's still really a dick yeah um I I want to say one more thing about that um um Austin one time uh he said that you you can't be a mega star without being very selfish, you know. John Cena, Steve Austin, The Rock, um, um, and in the, and in this case, Onita. You can't be a megastar without being incredibly selfish. And then, but the megastar rises the whole crew, and it's a hard argument. Um, that's all. But whatever. Well, that's the only Onita. issue, yeah, the only issue is here is it does Onita really have that same 
popularity that he did, you know, because if we're talking 94, 95 Onita, then yeah, he definitely, but this is 96, 97 Onita, and people are, and we'll get into it here in a couple of minutes, Onita, the fans are not the most keen on Onita coming back, especially the Tokyo fans. So that actually leads us right to November 26. Uh, on November 26, Onita appears at Kuroken Hall, and um, he, he, uh, he tells the fans that in his whole life he's told one lie, and that was that he would never wrestle uh, 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 again. And he asked the fans, "Will you allow me to come back for another their 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 match?" Um, what is the reaction from the fans? Yeah, they're booing him. I mean, it's it's loud booing. They are not happy that Onita's coming back. That show they're not welcoming onita back and so onita is trying to kind of i'm only coming back for one time this is i'm only coming back for mr pogo he's begging me look everyone he's mr pogo is begging how can i turn him down i have to come back i have to you know fight terry funk after what he's they've done to mr pogo and and he had came back after um make mention so this is the show where the funk masters are wrestling are just beating down mr pogo laying him out and onita comes to make the save and everything everything and and mr pogo you know asked for his comeback so again it's you know he's begging me i have to you know i have to accept it it's mr pogo he, um and again terry funk's been calling me out all like the last six months or so so i need to get revenge on him so this is you know kind of the best position they'll need to put himself into like look i have to come back and then the fans still turned on him because they knew nope you know you're just you're coming back after a year of, of retirement, you know, of, tour, of touring and everything, and you're coming back a, you're coming back too soon. I mean, he could have came back three years later in 98, and this pro he probably wouldn't have, you know, he probably would have been accepted a lot better. But 1996, just, you know, a year and a half after that retirement, that was just too soon, especially for the Corrigan audience. Now, um, so uh, December 11th is going to be the big show. It's set. Onita is going to... Um, uh, come back. Um, what are the main angles and what are the main matches set up for the show going into it? Yeah, so we have uh, Megumi Kudo taking on Shinobu Kandori. Like you may mention, Megumi Kudo's retiring, so she's kind of going on her own retirement tour at this point and, and facing off against the bigger name um, Japanese women wrestlers from other companies. And Shinobu Kandori is a legitimate uh, badass woman who who has done uh, women's MMA in the past. Um, and so FMW and LLPW come up with an agreement and uh, the first match is on this show and uh, Kudo is is brawling with Kandori and everything, but Kandori ends up just choking her out and uh, getting the win on this show. Um, and afterwards, Kudo attacks her. She's She wants another match. So this is going to – that'll lead to 1997. Um, and then you have the Gladiator versus Kanemura, um, and with the Gladiator uh, defeating Kanemura. So he merges the two – the independent title and the Brass Knuckles title. So now the Gladiator is the first double titles champion. So it was kind of a new um, – you know, like the first, it, it kind of became its own title belt. Um, and so like the gladiator was known as the first double titles champion. So that was kind of like, it created its own a brand new linear history of the title belts. So then we have, and then we have Hayabusa versus the great Sasuke. Um, this match is, I would consider kind of a disappointment. Um, I, you know, it's kind of a, would be known as a high flying dream match, but Hayabusa is still banged up around this time period. Um, and I actually asked him about this match and he said, yeah, both me and Sasuke were banged up still. Um, and so he was disappointed in the match. It's still a good match, but it's, you know, nothing like you would think a Hayabusa Sasuke match is, um, especially considering Hayabusa had a really good match with the Taka Minchinoku a month earlier, but this match is kind of a disappointment, but overall, um, a good match, but, and then we have, um, the retirement match with, uh, well, Mr. Pogo retiring, Asushi Onita coming back, uh, teaming up with Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Masato Tanaka. And I had made mention about politics and everything. Koji Nakagawa had, um, he worked for the office as well, and he wanted in this match. So he was originally scheduled for this match, and he wanted the pinfall. He wanted to get the pinfall and just politics and everything. He ended up getting um, pulled out of this match, and Tanaka ended up... Uh, getting the win over Terry Funk and um, it's Ter Terry Funk, the Headhunters, and Hisagatsu Oya, and it's just a crazy wild brawl for 20 minutes, pretty much. And er Funk is bleeding, and um, and f um, f 
pretty much just i mean it's a onita street fight i mean it's nothing great it's nothing like what the um you know wing fnw barbed wire matches from a couple months earlier that we were talking about it's nothing like that it's an onita street fight and it serves its purpose and um tanaka ends up getting the win over headhunter a and afterwards mr pogo and and onita are embracing and hayabusa is coming is actually out in the ring and you just see onita just over um you know and Hayabusa pretty much and just you know Onida and Pogo they look like the stars and Hayabusa who the whole company had been based around off of for a year and a half pretty much you know he looks secondary to Hi- Onida and, and that was Onida's plan though he wanted you know he wanted to come back and he wanted to be the top guy and you know there was always that kind of resentment of hey this is my promotion who are you to you know to be the number one guy I'm the number one guy so it's just you know this politic fighting and Onita kind of you know th- on this day Onita was the star and everything um so he you know was def- he looked you know and it's just going to be a fight throughout um for Onita and as far as just this political fight between the two yeah it makes it sound like uh when uh Hogan lost to the ultimate warrior but after the match, he's the one grandstanding and taking the shine and everything. Um, well, just I, I, I kind of think of it as I kind of think of it as uh, WrestleMania Nine with Hulk Hogan, uh, Bret Hart, and Yokozuna, and afterwards Hulk Hogan comes out and you know wins the title, and then he's the big deal again. I, I always think of it as that. It's, it's hey, I'm I'm back and I'm the star. You know, thanks for you know holding my seat, you know holding my crown for me. Now I you know I'm the the king is back. Get out of the way. Yeah. That's always my favorite. That's the funniest match for me because everyone is just pray, you know, and Bret Hart is saying, "No, Hogan, go, go, take the crown for me," you know. Um, anyway, um, so after the match, Hayabusa comes out and um, uh, he challenges Kenta Kobashi, who is, uh, you know, he's on fire in uh, in all j- j- Japan. I think he's the tri- the uh, uh, the uh, the triple crown champion at the moment. I think. Um, yeah. What is the story behind announcing that, you know, be, behind making this challenge? And is there already a deal in place? Like, what is the deal behind that? So with Onita coming back, Hayabusa decided, okay, how am I going to be different? I'm not going to compete with Onita in that style of, you know, just how he is and everything. I can't compete with like that. What can I do? I can out-wrestle Onita. I can be – I can – have these better better matches i can have these dream matches you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna set up to have matches with all japan wrestlers and and i can you know show my showcase my ability against the masawas against the kobashis and everything like that he and this was very well known but hayabusa had um been really close friends with mr hawa misawa um after hayabusa took over as the kind of the top guy misawa reached out to him and they became drinking buddies they would go out and um, go bar hopping together and everything so there was a relationship there already with misawa because misawa kind of respected you know it's kind of like you're the ace i'm the ace you know so there's that kind of relationship where um between the two but so hayabusa ended up but um hayabusa wanted matches with all japan so ironically enough um, you know, Hayabusa went to Arai and to set up uh, to see if they could get a uh, mat, you know, kind of Hayabusa in with All Japan. And, and Arai ended up having to go through Onita. That was because um, Onita had that relationship with Giant Baba. So Arai actually got Onita to reach out to Giant Baba, going, Hey, can Hayabusa start working for All Japan? And Baba goes, Okay, but I, I need to meet with Hayabusa first. So um, and nothing was set in stone when Hayabusa. Ibusa made the announcement when challenged Kenta Kobashi, and the match obviously never happened in a singles match or anything like that. But Hayabusa had to go meet up with Giant Baba to, um, you know, to get to kind of get Baba's permission to be able to work because at this time, um, you know, no no wrestler from another promotion had ever worked in all Japan. So this was kind of a you know a brand new thing that Hayabusa did, where he was coming in from a completely different promotion. You know, either you were, uh, you know, you were an all Japan guy if you were working all Japan. So Oh, this was, you know, this was something brand new at the time. But um, I also wanted to make mention, um, as far as, far as the December 11th show, um, and we were talking about Onita and everything, just to kind of show like Onita and just what he he thought of himself and everything. Um, and sorry, can you, can you you there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Were you gonna ask about the show? I I didn't because I, I thought I didn't know. If, <laughs> Because we kind of moved on from a, the t- December 11th, but I wanted to talk about Onita and the money he made for this show and stuff. Yeah, that was actually my next question. Yeah, how did the show okay. draw? Sorry, how sorry, did the I fan? 
no, no, we were just going off, and I didn't want to cut. I, you know, I didn't want to cut you off. Um, yeah. So yeah, how, yeah. How did the show draw? You know, what was Onita's um, 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 impact? You know, was he booed? Was he cheered? And everything. So this show was a sellout, and it was a financial success. And you know, uh, fans weren't. They didn't boo Onita or anything like this for this show. I mean, I think coming out with Mr. Pogo helped him and everything as well. But it it sold out. They drew nearly eight thousand um, people for a near, you know an eight thousand nearly eight thousand seat building. But here's the issue: so Onita reached out without telling Arai or FMW. Um, he reached out to BMG uh, Video, which was the video company that own um, that did the commercial videos for Onita's FMW. He reached out to them and came up with his own deal for them to videotape his match and everything. And so this really upset Toshiba M- 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 EMI. Um, you know, they been, they'd taken over um, the commercial releases for FMW after Onita, um, you know, with the Hayabusa era FMW. And so they go, wait, why is BMG going to release a video when we own the rights to, you know, we have a deal with FMW. And so they had to come up with a deal where only this Onita match, the Onita Pogo match, would air, or you know, with BMG video. And so Toshiba couldn't release the Onita match on their commercial tape. So the Toshiba um, release has Ayabusa vs. Sasuke as the main event, and uh, the BMG uh, BMG video has Onita, the Onita Pogo Terry Funk match, and then they also threw in some like old Onita Pogo matches also to kind of fill out the tape and everything. So this this show has two different commercial tape releases release um for this and it, like i said it really upset uh the toshiba people who kind of saved fmw because without them they wouldn't have any tv at the time but then you also have um like i said it was a financial success but then so you have onita he took the royalties from the bmg and so he got forty thousand dollars so he got all the money from the bmg video so FMW did not make um, at this at this time they didn't receive any money from the BMG side of it. So Onita made forty thousand dollars. Then he goes, I'm taking fifty thousand dollars for this show. So um, the show only is so, so he made fifty thousand dollars personal, and the show only made eighty thousand dollars. I mean, which is a huge success for FMW. They made eighty thousand dollars, and so like I said, Onita pocketed fifty thousand. And then the commercial, uh, he got forty thousand, so he got ninety thousand dollars right there. And FMW go, hey, you got to pay us that money back. The BMG video, and Onita goes, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. It took him two years to pay him thirty thousand dollars back, so he ended up pocketing ten thousand dollars eventually. Or, you know, uh, um, profiting ten thousand dollars, but you know, he got forty. FMW didn't see that money for the thirty thousand dollars for two years. So, you know, so all, like I said, already right away, you're dealing with Onita and just, you know, the dealing with all the Onita politics and everything and just, you know, uh, taking all the money. And so, like I said, a financial, a, a financial success, a successful financial show wasn't a successful financial show for the company itself because Onita ended up taking all the money. Well, thank God that they won that money in that poll, you know, the, uh, yeah, exactly. The, the poll that $200,000. Um, so, um, so, okay. Uh, so the show drew, uh, do you know the number on the, on the, the show? The people? I think it was like 7,900, 7,993, something. It was close to 8,000. All right, cool. And, um... So, uh, okay, before we, because I've only got two more notes here, um, uh, do you have anything else you want to say about the show before we go on? Um, yeah, as far as the overall show, it was okay. I would consider it a disappointment, especially this is, you know, kind of a great time period with FNW and, um, you know, the Kawasaki show was, was a great show. Um, the Shio Dome show we talked about in August was okay. It was a lot of bad matches. The Tanaka, um, Kanemura match was great though. And then we have this show, um, which, you know, like I said, it was kind of disappointing. The, the, uh, Kanemura gladiator match was pretty good. Um, but you know, this Onita street fight was okay. Which was kind of a disappointment. So it's kind of a disappointment overall, I would say just as far as big matches around this time period, because the Corgan hall shows were so great, you know, you know, with so many great six man matches. So to ha- kind of have two back to back Shidome and the Komazawa shows in August and December kind of be, you know, slightly disappointing shows, you know, although they were financial successes over, as far as crowd goes, you know, I would cons- kind of consider it a disappointment overall, considering this is a great time period for FMW. 
So um, this goes on to, uh, on December 24th, FMW, they ran a show in Kurokin Hall. They drew, like, I think 900 or so people, and they only held two uh, um, actual matches. What was this show, uh, you know, what, what kind of was this? This was a fan appreciation show, so I don't know as far as, like, how they were able to, you know, um, put the money down for a Corgan Hall show and not, you know, expect the normal Corgan. Morgan Hall number, but it was just a fan appreciation show. It had Mr. Pogo's retirement. Um, also, Mr. Pogo was getting married around this time period as well. Um, but then you also had all the FMW wrestlers, and and FMW had a fan club around this time period as well. So it was you know, a big way for the fan club members to get to meet with the wrestlers and stuff like that. And all the wrestlers um, dressed up as different gimmicks. So like you had Hayabusa, he he dressed up as Miss Mongol, who um, was the FMW be women's wrestler at the time um and so like you had um you know you had one of the wrestlers dress up as a as pandita you had all these just everyone just dressed up in different gimmicks so it's just kind of a comedy show and like i said it was just kind of a pre just kind of you know it wasn't taped or anything like that it was just kind of give the fan club and the hardcore fans you know something to you know kind of you know like i said a fan appreciation type way of just kind of getting to hang out with the wrestlers and just kind of have have a watch a comedy show and no, no one took it serious no one no one took any major bumps or anything like that yeah um i was actually able to attend one of these for freedoms uh last december and they're a good time like you said the fan you know the wrestlers come out there's you know we had one at a bar and there was drinks and food and uh gentaro gave me the the, the double eye poke and it was a fun time <laughs> Um, so, uh, with that, the year kind of wraps up. Uh, I just want to ask one more. So is Onita back? Was this a one-time thing? Are there talks for him to come back full, full, full time? And what's going on with FNW and, uh, uh, AJP, P, A, and damn, let me do that one more time. And, uh, what is the relationship at this point with FNW and all Japan? So as far as Hayabusa or working with All Japan, like I said, he's still going to have to meet with Giant Baba. He um, it was, I believe, February or so before he would meet up with Giant Baba and the agreement would start up. So, but obviously, like I said, it, you know, Hayabusa would begin working for All Japan on his off dates of FMW. But um, as far as Onita coming back full time, he. He, um, you know, he said for this show he was only going to come back one time. Well, then one time came back, you know, then it's the Poro show. I'm coming back just this one time. And then eventually it was, all right, he's pretty much back. Now, Onita didn't want to work a full schedule. But – and here's another aspect of it is Onita had – girlfriends all over the country and, and so he wanted to work different cities he didn't really want to work you don't you know during this time period Oni does, does not work that, that many Tokyo shows um it's usually you know the Fukuoka's or um you know Sapporo because he had a girlfriend in each of these cities and so he wanted to go see each of these girlfriends so if you see on the show, it's and it's it's because around this time it's because he wants to go see his girlfriend in, in each city. But he's back pretty much as far he's not full time. He's not working every show, but like I said, he's working you know a good he's working a good number of shows based off of wanting to see his girlfriend. All right, cool girlfriends. <laughs> and um, overall, how would you say FMW did in 1996? Um, it was. It did a great. This was probably the number one year for the promotion. I mean, as far as the neat in the new FMW and, and whatnot. Like I said, you know, but also it had to do with the the wrestle bubble, the wrestling bubble in Japan, and you know, all these promotions are doing great. All Japan, New Japan, you know, Michinoku Pro is able to run Sumo Hall, um, you know, just things like that. Are, are it's kind of the boom period for Japanese wrestling, and so FMW definitely took advantage of it. They made, you know, like I said, they were running a profitable promotion. Um, they were also kind of innovative around, um, they started their own website in 1996, which, you know, not a lot of companies had a, had a website in 1996. So I believe they were the first Japanese promotion to have a, um, a website covering everything. So they were kind of innovative in that aspect. But like I said, it was definitely a successful year. You know, they had a lot of sponsors, um, you know, promoting their shows and everything like that. And, and you know, Hayabusa's back now. Hayabusa um, is going to worked the full time 1997 his injuries are pretty much you know i mean it's still it still took a little while in 1997 for them to fully recover but he you know is 1997 is probably going to be his you know prime year also 
So, so you know, the future's looking bright for FMW at this point um, with having, you know, started off so with such a struggle um, after Onita retired and, you know, only drawing 200, 300 fans at the beginning. You know, now it's a legitimate company. They're the number three company. And Onita actually had said um, he wanted to become the number one or two promotion. He wanted to move FMW to, you know, above New Japan and All Japan. Obviously, that never happened. But, you know, at this time period, it wasn't out of the reach that this was a possibility um but obviously like i said it never ended up happening because all japan and new japan were hot also around this time period okay that'll do it for 1996 uh before we go you had mentioned last episode that fnw they uh you know the super battle fnw show uh we're talking right now 2018 um that they found a sponsor they've got a couple shows coming up um do you have any other news maybe about onita's uh uh candid uh what is he running for, mayor? Yeah, he's running uh, for mayor of uh, Saga Kan Kansai. Um, it, the election's April fifteenth, uh, so in a couple weeks we'll find out if he is the mayor. Um, also, um, I may mention last episode where um, they had a they were going to have a high boost. A, a Hayabusa um, kind of just talk show segment in. Um, in Tokyo, and so a bunch of the FNW wrestlers, um, you know, had met up and and talked about Hayabusa, told stories and everything. But they also announced on this show, uh, uh, Kanemura is going to be promoting his own wrestling show, uh, wrestling promotion called Ing. So it's I N G, and um, it's going to be you know just his friends Tanaka, Kuroda, Hosaka against low level talent. It's going to be a like a wrestling. Um, it's going to be in a little 250 seat concert hall. So it's going to going to have a band as well as a wrestling show also um but they also announced that super leather was going to be coming in um for one of their shows in the summer so uh mike kirshner's going to be showing back up in japan here in the next couple months to as uh, him and kanamura are pretty close um i i i mute my mic when you're talking but i let out a belly laugh at ing it's going to be ing um <laughs> And uh, one other bit of news I just want to say, uh, Freedom's held a show on, oh, I don't have the date in front of me, I believe it was March 25th, or maybe the 24th, but um, in the main event, uh, Takeda defeated, 22nd, okay, 22nd. thank you, uh, in the main event, uh, Takeda defeated Kenji Fukumoto, and, um, yeah, and uh, after the match, um, I haven't seen the full video, I've seen highlights from, like, you know, the Battlemen show, and obviously a bunch of photos, but afterwards, V, you know, Violento Jack uh, came out. He attacked the two of them. He challenged Takeda to a match, which this is like for me. It's a dream match that I've been waiting for a year for, and I just can't go. I spent an hour looking at trains and planes and doing math, and I just can't afford to go. It's just too much to take that time off work and everything. But they're going to be having a match on May second, um, and then uh, uh, and I just it, it was just an, an incredible angle for a, for a promotion the, the level of freedoms. So we have that match coming up, and actually Takeda is going to uh, wrestle Abdullah Kobayashi for bit for the the Big Japan Death Match title on May fifth. Um, it, uh, it's going to be in Yokohama, but there's a real I think there's a real strong chance that Takeda might end up holding both titles, which for me as a big Takeda mark, I will say that. Uh, uh, I think that's such a awesome, you know, I'm excited for this match. That's all I can say. I'm really excited. And I keep joking that this is kind of creating the, uh, the death match triple crown in a way to have both of the titles on the same guy. So I think it's very interesting. Um, so I would worry though, this is to Jack though. I would, I would worry if he loses to Jack that he's going to lose to Kobayashi. Politics. I was, so yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that as well. I was like, it's either going to be one or the two. He's either going to win or he's going to lose both. But if you've seen Kobayashi move, I mean, there's just not much he can do. And I would think that uh, Big Japan is building up uh, Messiah Takahashi to be the one to take the title from ta from ta Takeda uh, sometime this year. I mean, th this is all my speculation. I have no Yeah, no Big idea. Japan's weird, though. I mean, they ran... And they ran Takahashi versus uh, Ueki uh, at Sumo Hall, so they they're you know I mean that's not something that you would think would draw at Sumo Hall, so their bookings kind of all all over the just random sometimes. Yeah, another thing that um, is always kind of mentioned is that Big Japan they never change the titles in Tokyo; they always change it in uh, a different city. And Yokohama is kind of a city where they might want to do a title change. Uh, we'll have to see. It's either gonna be one or the other, like you said. Um, 
But okay, that's about it. Uh, Brett, if you want to just uh, give people uh, your, you know, your contact info and where they can find you. Yeah, so I'm on, um, I'm on uh, Twitter at BahuFMW, Instagram, BahuFMW World. Post twenty pictures, twenty or twenty pictures every four or five days or so of just F and W shots, F and W IWA wing, just from magazine. I have a collection of hundreds of Japanese wrestling magazines from the nineties, and just every couple of days I go through and take about twenty pictures or so of what I find. Um, I'm also on uh, YouTube, Brett F. FMW. I just came out with a uh, Masato Tanaka career music video, and I showed it to Tanaka, and he loved it. Said it was the best tribute video he's ever seen of him. That's been made of him, and he posted on Facebook. He posted on Twitter. Um, a bunch of Japanese wrestlers commented how great it was. Uh, Takashita from DDT mentioned how great it was. Um, Hartley Jackson from Zero One. Like so, a lot of wrestlers got to see this video. So I was really proud of it. I, I think it came out really well. It was a 30 minute video that covered all 25 years of his career. So I was really proud of that. And um, like you said earlier, uh, Bahu FNW, Bahu's FNW Worlds is uh, BahuFNW.com as well as FNWWrestling.us. And every month or so, I do a news update and I keep up with all the results of all the FNW Freedom uh, wrestlers throughout the years. And just anything anything to do with FNW or Freedoms, I write about. And uh, and also, Bahu is probably the only place that you're really going to be able to find, uh, you know, to 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 be able to find uh, 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 DVD copies of the ongoing Freedom shows. Um, so yeah, if you want to add that stuff, you know, if you want to create a bookshelf of shows, Bahu is the the guy to go to for that. Um, one other bit of news that we didn't talk about, uh, just a, a small thing, Mister Ganoske, he actually wrestled his final match at Kur- at Kurokan Hall. Again, I don't have the date in front of me, uh, but he wrestled for March Ice 25th. Ribbon. March 25th. You yeah, know March. everything, man. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it was uh, he wrestled for for uh, Ice Ribbon, which is a women's company, but they do a lot of stuff w- with men, and they actually do a lot of hardcore, and uh, they do some uh, uh, some death matches yeah. here and there. But he had a... He, he had helped. Yeah, he, he, sorry. He had helped train a lot of the girls back then. He was the Ice Ribbon uh, dojo trainer back in, like, 2008 2009 2010 so a lot of these girls that like the that he worked with the, those are girls he helped train and everything 10 years ago or so now when is it so when is going to be his final show that's gonna be april 15th so he's he um you know he came back three and a half years ago uh he was he didn't want to come back and guts ishijima who is who runs guts world said please come back please start working for us um you know you'll help us a lot and so ganasuke came back and he's you know worked uh various indie promotions as well as guts world but guts world was kind of his main promotion and guts world is closing down april 15th and with that ganasuke announced that he's going to retire again um so he's going to wrestle his last match on april 15th for the last guts world show of uh, Shinjuku face. Um, he's going to team up with Michio uh, Kajiyama, who's a Nagoya-based wrestler who kind of dressed him. He's kind of got the same tights and the blonde hair and everything. He's going to take on uh, Tatsumi uh, Fujinami and Hiro Saito. Uh, Fujinami is one of Ganasuke's childhood favorites growing up. He's a big, big New Japan fan. Um, I think it's his second favorite wrestler behind uh, Riki Choshu. So um, he's going to wrestle him in his final match. And then afterward, he's already got, he's already uh, um, married he got married a couple weeks ago and he's going to move back to kumamoto where um so, so where he's originally from um back when he was 17 18 when he went to college and everything so he's moving he's completely giving up the wrestling business this time nothing he will have no, nothing to do with the wrestling business after after april 15th all right so with that we're gonna wish you uh farewell and uh we'll be back uh we'll be back next time with with uh 1997 and we're just going to keep on going. So thank you guys for, uh, for tuning in. See you later.